And good morning. Welcome to ADA, our panel discussion. Our big topic is data and the environment. We will have an interesting panel discussion on data protection and the digital salvation of the world. Where are the red lines? We haven't started yet, but we are going to start right now. So I may ask my panelists to come on stage. Let me welcome Geraldine de Bastion. She is going to be the facilitator. Thank you and good morning to all of you. Sunday morning, 10 a.m. I'm very happy to be here today and it is also a pleasure for me to welcome all of you this morning. It's the first time that I facilitate a discussion here at the Technical University, a wonderful stage and a wonderful Sunday morning, 10 a.m. So it's a pleasure for me to be your facilitator, as I said, as we have uh, already announced. We are going to talk about data, data protection, climate change and how to save our world. We all know that uh, according to most recent information and uh, investigation. We know we have to become more climate friendly, reduce our CO2 emissions so that our world can survive. And one theory is that we can use digitization, the data we can uh, collect, so that will help us to save the world. That is to say the data that we can capture now and in the future can be used to carry out investigation to become more climate friendly and make a contribution to develop in the right direction. We are going to speak about the framework conditions that we need and the prerequisites that it takes to make this progress. This is what we would like to talk, to discuss with our panelists and all of you. I would like to introduce my panelists. Svelin Hoys has been uh, the Managing Director of Greenpeace Germany since 2016. She is in charge of communication fundraising and digital affairs. Kathleen Berger is a political scientist and consultant for international cooperation and she works with Mozilla and she is leading their engagement with global internet fora and interna international policy work with the G20 and the World Economic Forum. Luis Neves Luis Neves is Managing Director of Global E-Sustainability Initiative and he is trying to build a bridge between uh, ICT, climate change and sustainability. Welcome to you. And then last but not least, I have the pleasure of announcing uh, Thomas Engelter. Since 2016, he's has been the head of uh, the team Energy and Construction in the Consumer Watchdog Center. I am Geraldine de Bastian. I run an agency for international and digital cooperation connective and I also have an NGO and this is my field of work. Let me start by saying that the first half of our panel, we would like to talk about the issues at hand to map the topic, to map the issues. And then as a next uh, step, I'd like to talk about um, conflicts between climate protection and data protection. And then, of course, we are going to open for your comments and questions. It would be interesting for all of us to know who you are out there in the lecture hall. Climate protection and digitalization, how are these two topics interconnected? Where is the hope when we look at a more digital world and a more climate friendly world? So let me give you the floor first. I think generally speaking, we can say we need digitalization for climate protection. I think we all agree on that. So the question just is, what exactly do we need what kind of digitalization do we need? The 
data consumption, the increasing data consumption, is that something sustainable already? Uh, it, does that uh, mean we can use renewable energies to, to drive all the internet resources uh, we need for our data consumption? And then it's also a question of what happens to the data that uh, gets collected and uh, analyzed. Climate protection, of course, from the point of view of Greenpeace, means that we live in a world where we have an increasing demand for data, and we are talking about a doubling of uh, the data amounts year by year. In that context, we need to really ask ourselves, how can we ensure an energy transition? How can we work in such a world in an energy efficient way? This is an issue not only for Germany, but for the world at large. And here we have so far reached a level that uh, is not yet satisfying. We need to make more progress. Now, coming back to what you said, major corporations already know what needs to be done. They exactly know that they have to get used to renewable energies. Uh, Apple is m making headway, other corporations do much less. We have to watch those corporations. We have to see what they are doing. And uh, can we really measure what they are doing, or is it all intransparent? We are going to look at the actors and their role, but thank you for giving us a general background regarding digitalization. Digitalization as a technology that also needs energy resources. Now, let me also uh, hand over to the other panelists to find out what is the major connection between climate protection and digitalization. Louis. There was a headline this year in the newspapers saying that uh, the energy consumption of a blockchain transaction is just as high as the energy consumption of a detached house in the US. Oftentimes, uh, people talk about threats regarding the energy consumption of digital assets. What do you think about that? Do you think that is really true, or is it ju just uh, exaggeration, or do you really see a clash between digitalization and our need to focus on energy efficiency and renewables? For the invitation. Um, I like very much this debate because um, there's lots of, co of conversation around it. and. Um, in GSE, in the Global East Sustainability Initiative, we have been following this discussion since 2008. And uh, actually, the discussion started with a report from Gartner, a consultancy, where they were criticizing the industry that our emissions, global emissions, were equivalent to the aviation sector. That was in 2008. So we decided in GSE to do a, a big report uh, an independent report that was, uh, uh, let's say, overlooked by the climate group in London, <coughs> which is an NGO, um, very recognized. And the report was done by McKinsey. And we asked McKinsey three questions. One, what is our footprint? What is the enabling capacity of the industry? And the third question is, what, what is the business value? Because for companies, the business value is always very relevant. And uh, the conclusion of the report was, they confirmed the 2% of the global footprint of the industry. But what they also confirmed is that the enabling capacity, it was five times bigger than our own footprint. So we can impact different sectors like mobility, energy, ag agriculture, and so on, five times more than our own footprint. Uh, and then the business value, I cannot remember, it was a couple of billions of euros. What we have done, and I will close because I think that we have time to go in more detail, we've done two additional reports, one in 2012 that we called SMART 2020 with the same three questions, and we did in 2015 one called Smart 2030 with the same three questions. In the latest one, uh, the two reports confirmed that the energy consumption global of our industry is going down, is not going up. In 2015, it was 1.25 gigatons of CO2, which was less than the 2% that we calculated in 2008. 
and the enabling potential was 10 times bigger. So we are impacting much more the other industry sectors than in 2008. So we have been running these reports every three years. Next year we'll be doing another one called Smarter 2030 Reload. Uh, and we will take into account blockchain, crypto cryptocurrency, 5G deployment, artificial intelligence developments, and so on and so on. Let's see what's coming out from that. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank dafür. Vielleicht noch ganz kurz Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask our audience, I should have told you before, uh, Louis understands German, but he is going to answer in English. If anyone needs a translation into German, is, if that is the case. Oh, you all have a translation. Okay, I could have uh, tried to match you with somebody who could provide the translation for you, but if you already have interpretation, it's fine. It's wonderful to have such positive uh, assessments about the future. Oftentimes, when we talk about uh, digitalization and something smart, it is not always uh, positively seen. What, what do you think about it? I think there are two things we need to have in mind, and that is uh, why I think it's so important that the environmental movement and the digital movement get together. The environmental movement was very successful uh, about uh, renewable energies, uh, ozone um, layer depletion, to make this the general talk, the general discussion in society, and we've reached major success. Uh, today we uh, know something is going wrong, although we might not all understand the technical details. Now, how can we improve digital technologies? And here we say uh, we've been doing that for many years as the digital movement, and uh, there are also a number of problems that we have identified. For instance, our scene can say, what is smart? What are the consequences? What are the risks of our industry? So here the environmental movement uh, has made progress uh, in the 70s and 80s in identifying risks. We as the digital movement, we are doing this right now when we talk about smart cities and all of that. Of course, uh, we uh, understand we can contribute to less pollution, air pollution by making transport smart. We can also make sure that uh, waste disposal will be rationalized by just uh, collecting trash where it is. So from the point of view of the digital movement, we also need to say there are certain patterns that uh, also need surveillance. What does it mean to digitize the public sphere? What does it mean if every step of mine can be traced when my uh, geodata being stored. Everybody know or people know where I am, where I go, who I meet. So this also has repercussions on our autonomy, our personal freedom. And here we need to discuss all these issues. And uh, I think here the environmental movement and the digital movement can learn a lot from each other. We as the digital movement can explain those terms and the environmental movement can do a better risk uh, analysis and environmental impact analysis. So, and that environmental impact assessment will also have in mind the aspect of personal freedoms. Climate protection from the consumer perspective, what do you would like to say? Uh, well, consumer protection. We carry out opinion polls on a regular basis, and as an answer, we usually hear that four-fifths of the population, that is to say 80 percent, are very positive uh, when it comes to the goals of the energy transition that Germany has put on its agenda. When we look back 20 years, there were a couple of thousands of uh, power plants that produced electricity and heat, and today we have over two million generators. These are the prosumers, producers and consumers at the same time. That is to say, digitization in the energy sector is a very important participation project, and we support it because it's a great thing to have. It's wonderful when the consumers get a proper share and a role of their own in energy generation so they can identify with the energy transition, which is an important aspect, and they have ownership of environmental protection. That's a positive example. On the other hand, we also have the question of 
data collection. Of course, we need to uh, collect data in order to ensure a smooth operation of technical processes, but these are individual data of consumers too. So we need to ask ourselves what happens to these data. Yes, this is exactly what we'd like to discuss now, which data are important, which are the data that can make our society more environmentally friendly. What are the most important data? Uh, what are we talking about when we talk about data? I would say it's all the data that we need in order to provide a proper service. I cannot uh, specifically identify individual sets of data, but let's go back one more step. Big data, what is it? It's a collection of data that can be analyzed on the basis of algorithms. And this uh, analysis is currently uh, discussed. What do people do with these data? I, as a consumer and as an environmentalist, would like to know how can these data be tracked down to individual people. I mean, big data is a set of lots of individual data. Where do they come from? Which data are we talking about? Like, for instance, my domestic energy consumption, which will be read by my smart meter at home. What kind of data are being captured at the moment uh, for future analysis and what do we still need? Um, smart meter is a good example. The idea, first of all, was to introduce those smart meters so that not only industry but also private households could uh, save energy. That means that uh, households should use energy at the time when we have a lot of electricity, renewable e electricity in the net, then I switch on my domestic devices. And when there is not enough energy from renewable sources, I should save. Practically, that means you have to have a smart meter and those smart meters collect data. And the question that cropped up in recent years is, what happens to those data? Where do they go? For instance, when do I use my washing machine, my dishwasher. Of course, I can easily read uh, the meter and when my consumption is near to zero uh, in summer or so, people would see I'm not at home. Who gets the data? Who has information that I'm not at home? So basically, those data, according to current regulation, should only go to the grid operator. That is to say, the company that uh, provides electricity and infrastructure. This company is to get the data. But then, if they ask the consumer, can I use these data also for other purposes, and the consumer says yes, then those corporations can also make these data available to third parties. And then, of course, somebody could read the individual consumption patterns and uh, respond by providing advertising or whatever. I read that uh, in order to use more renewable energy, it is very important to have these data because you can regulate energy or electricity grid fluctuations in a better way. Is that correct? Well, you have to weigh the pros and cons. Which are the data that I absolutely need for my analysis? And uh, like you said, it is important, of course, to have data in order to be able to control and uh, use green electricity at the time when it's available and also make sure that we get as much renewable energy into our grid as possible. The question just is, are these data passed on to third parties, yes or no? And then, of course, uh, we need to look which are the essential data and which are the data that are collected but need not be collected, generally speaking. So we would like to switch to renewables and we need to guarantee the stability of the grid. Which are the data, the private consumption data that are required? I think our colleagues knows more about it. This is currently being debated. How, for instance, utilities, they would like to have as many data as possible. They would like to have all individual household data. And others say, no, this is nonsense. We don't need all these uh, data. In order to control the grids, 
in a sustainable, efficient way, it is enough to have accumulated data, like, for instance, from coming from a whole street or a residential area. So the question is, how much individual data do I really need, or can I aggregate data for further analysis? This is what we deal with, too. It's not just the uh, electricity uh, operator who is interested in getting data, but also the manufacturers of uh, household devices are interested. I mean, uh, if the law says we use aggregated data, we cannot properly control what happens to our individual data. These are important as, um, questions regarding consumer protection, because if all my household devices, devices are networked and I can read consumption patterns, uh, I mean, the dominant business model in the Internet is advertising, not just general advertising, but personalized advertising. That is to say, the more... Uh, advertisers know about me, the more they can tailor their advertising to my personal patterns. That is to say, those data uh, also raise uh, business interests of uh, data loggers. Micro-targeting is one of the buzzwords. It's another topic, but we are not just talking about advertising for consumption, also for elections and so on and so forth. So when I say my smart meter collects data and I agree uh, to these data being passed on, but if these data link to my mobile phone that I have with me every time I go and my telephone is next to Geraldine's, they know we are in the same room. These sets of data can tell people a lot about my interests, my network and the things that are important to me. And if these uh, pat these data are aggregated, still the patterns are being captured. And the question is, uh, when will these individual data be deleted? Do I as a consumer still have control over my data or do I get manipulated because I have no idea who's got the data about me and who sells my data and uh, I don't get a share of the profit? Right, this is one example. The energy consumption in my home, and we have heard about the fields of tension and the potential players who are involved, the data suppliers, the manufacturers of the devices, the utilities, but it's not only about designing systems, it's also about ecological and economic interests, right? Puzzled with the, the conversation here, because we we talking about things which are cross-cutting, so you are talking about uh, the issue of trust and privacy of data, and, uh, and then you are questioning about the uh, environmental impact of uh, technology. So the biggest energy consumption in our industry comes from the infrastructure. So it's the mobile infrastructure, the, the, the fixed infrastructure and data centers. So that's where the biggest uh, energy consumption. Uh, when it comes to data security, smart meters is you know, is a very small example. You know, we need to think about data security in all its dimensions. So I enter this building here. I connect myself to Wi-Fi. Immediately, if I have a system in my iPhone that protects my iPhone, which I have, I get a message saying, you are on an insecure environment. So that means my iPhone, if, if it's not secure, people can get my data from my iPhone. A hacker can get my data. And so do we all realize this? So in this context, what is the relevance of a discussion around a specific product like smart, smart meter? I don't want to be provocative. I think no, that please do. I, I think, I think that we, we need to, if we want to talk about data, its implications and so on, we need to understand the overall dimension on it. It's much, much more complicated. We are moving, and I agree with you, we are moving to a very difficult world where we see new developments like artificial intelligence. Uh, there are things happening in our back that we do not realize. And uh, there is a need for a, a very deep discussion 
around this matter, which involves the civil society, the, the, the policy, uh, so the political actors, and the companies and the industry. And we are not doing that. So. Uh, when it comes about, uh, about this, uh, I like very much, and if you allow me, a citation of Carl Sagan. Give me just one minute. We created a global civilization in which its most essential elements, transport, communication, and all other industries like agriculture, medicine, education, entertainment, environmental protection, and even the key institution of any democracy, which is voting, uh, are heavily dependent on science and technology. And I think this is clear to all of us. At the same time, we have also been able to organize everything so that almost nobody understands science and technology. This is the recipe for disaster. We may even be able to live like this for a while, but sooner or later, this explosive combination of ignorance and power will burst our hands. And this is the problem that we need to address when we talk about these issues. Uh, so, to finalize and to allow my colleagues to, to jump in, in the, into the discussion, uh, we're talking about many different things. So, if you ask me, is, there, is ICT increasing the energy, global energy consumption of the world? I tell you, no. ICT is becoming every day more efficient. We dematerialize, we get rid of devices. We are every day more and more efficient. Of course, you can tell me, oh, oh but mm, there is more data on the internet, there are more photographies, more information, there is more people in the world, it's right. But everything is going more and more efficient, and to finalize with your question, we are designing in a different way. So the design approach to products and services is totally different today from what it was in the past. And that will play a fundamental role because <clears throat> that will close the circle that we, we are now call it the circle economy. So we design now for circle economy in a way whereby most of the things that we do, either we get rid of all devices or what we design can be put back into the system without the use of additional resources. It was a very broad answer, I apologize, but I, th I wanted to, to, to get the conversation a little, a little bit more exciting. I, I'm, um, I was hoping that my initial hope was the meine ach, Deutsch English. Ich dachte erst, dass wir well, I thought it might make sense to focus on the practical side first of all. However, everybody wants to have the philosophical debate right now in the morning. So we might come back to what we have talked about so far. And thus I say I agree. We do need a societal debate about what society are we building today. But then I'd like to ask everybody here, what can we do in order to have this debate take place, not only in the civil society, because we also need to get the governments and the industry involved. Unternehmensseite da sind, müssen wir nicht gleichzeitig auch aktiv vorangehen und unsere eigenen Systeme bauen. And maybe we also have to consider the question whether it's necessary to build our own systems in order to have the data used not only for the corporations and their interests. Well, let me start. This is indeed a philosophical question. And we do see more and more monopolies in the industrial context. Because it's true, we are enjoying more and more services, but we pay for them. And our payment are 
our data. Facebook was founded 12 or 15 years ago, and the world has changed considerably since then. So we need to try and understand what is happening. I am working in the field of strategies, and I wonder what is the impact? What are the implications? We realize that something is going wrong. It's like with the climate change. And once you don't trust the system anymore, you continue, and you continue nevertheless, because you don't know what to do, actually, and this is a challenge. As long as the user doesn't go and say, I want a different system, the system won't change, because this is about profit, and that's the challenge I see. Now, our developments need to be future-oriented, but they also need to be technology-neutral. And I need to know what I want. Do I want to destroy the, mon the monopolies, or do I want to protect the consumer? That's what I need to know before I can go for any type of regulation. And I think we need to question the overall business model, which consists of offering services and receiving data in exchange. And I also need to ask how I can convince users to ask more. How do I get the user, the individual, to understand that he, she needs to be in control? So. The others are powerful, but things can change. That's my conclusion. Gerade zum Beispiel Greenpeace und der CCC ihre eigenen Smart Citizen, Smart City Konzepte vorlegen und ganz arg auch in die praktische Entwicklung gemeinsamer Systeme. Would this mean that Greenpeace or the CCC offer concepts in order to have us? And I get an idea of what the smart city is. Now, is this the question of platform capitalism versus the environmental movement? And indeed, the platform capitalists are still more powerful. They control the market. They have the monopolies. And they decide what is being innovated. And thus, they decide which algorithms are used for this purpose. I'd be happy to see environmental organizations develop mobility apps. But I'm not sure whether we can sell them as good as a corporation can. I might also need new alliances, like the one you just suggested, including uh, political players, cities, decision makers. I'm often involved in meetings like this one, and I do see a lot of powerlessness especially with respect to the question of innovation, who can innovate, who has the power of innovation. But I do see alternatives as well. Unfortunately, nobody works on these alternatives, it seems. Now that gets me back to the question of mobility. Look at the automotive industry. Look at the corporations. They love the combustion engine. They do. But sustainable developments would incorporate networks and networked offers. Volkswagen, however, is dealing with the diesel scandal, and they are apparently not capable of changing the systems. 
upgrading them using more e-mobility. There is a project in Hanover. There are collective buses, buses that stop in certain streets and they collect passengers. Now, if people want to move from a similar area to another place at the same time, you can use an app in order to have one and the same bus carry several passengers who are nearby. Volkswagen is funding such a project, which could be a point of departure. The next wave of innovation and of revenue that is generated could start from there, but it must not be the big corporations. It should rather be others, also groups or initiatives which consider the ethical dimension of what they do more than corporations like Volkswagen. We, I think, are capable of distinguishing between what is allowed and what is forbidden, right? Now, there are similar projects. Clever Shuttle would be an example I'd mention. There are alternatives. This is what I'm trying to say. Also, shuttle services using e-mobility, e-vehicles. Maybe the potential is there, and we just have to ask, how can we find a solution which involves redesigned models and alliances. The mobility app is certainly interesting, and of course it's based on open source programs. Now, in terms of regulation, the government could go and say apps like these need to be based on open source software. The principle which is being implemented here is the collectivo principle, i.e., I have a bus for several people and I don't pay the price for a taxi, but much less. So you can use open source in order to do a lot against monopolies. You can open the monopolization in order to also adapt, adapt these systems in other fields. Open source, you said, and I say open data and climate protection. If you go and Google open data and climate protection, you see lots of cities. So Google lists one city after the next. Apparently, many cities are involved in similar activities. So when reading this, you think, that's cool. Apparently, each German city has an open data initiative which has an ecological standing and is aware of the climate change problematic. However, the question is, is this a matter of communities, of municipalities, of local authorities only, or do we also see similar approaches on the national level? Right now, we are talking about big data and we have the smart city discourse, but we don't talk about open data anymore. I think a few years ago, we would have talked about open data much more than we do today. But isn't this about free access, accessibility, and more than just commercial interests? Let me try and answer your questions in spite of the fact that this is not necessarily about consumer protection. I do see a clear advantage here. It's a benefit. Today, on the basis of open data, I can run platforms, which I couldn't run before in the past. And if these data are being offered voluntarily and if they are not being accumulated, it's a real benefit. Now, we want to be part of a network. We want to have everybody use what we offer. That's, that's a clear benefit for all of us. It gets difficult once the question of power, powerlessness, is involved. 
Let's look at the structures. I start off with um, monopolies or oligopolies. And once it grows, once it gets bigger, it gets more problematic, it gets more difficult. We often hear, well, we do have the informed consumer and he, she, they can decide whatever they want to do or have or give. However, there is not the consumer. There are lots of different groups of consumers. There are technic nerds, tech, technology nerds who love it, who just love it. We have the passive user. We have the fearful user. Many different groups. Now, how do we protect all these groups so that the data are not used against their will, so that the data are not collected? against their will. This is a real problem. And last but not least, this is an important aspect. And here regulation is involved. In spite of the fact that people don't like the idea of legislation, regulation, laws, I say we need laws and it's much easier to pass laws on a national level than passing European laws. It's an important brickstone. I've got one or two questions still to be discussed on the panel before I open to our audience. Uh, you were just nodding and saying that we need regulation. I personally think that maybe we need a complete turnaround in the way of thinking. Maybe we should focus on transparency, openness, openness of uh, artificial intelligence uh, that are relevant for the public. We should make sure maybe that data are made public, uh, can be used by everyone. Some can make, use them for business purposes, but also for other ones. Uh, the, the question of open data <coughs> is very interesting. <coughs> I want to start with a point. So. For people to have open data, you need an infrastructure, right? So if you need an infrastructure, someone has to pay for it, which are the companies. The companies want to make money. If, if, they, if they have an infrastructure, if they have to invest, if, if Deutsche Telekom in Germany is investing in 5G, it will cost billions of euros. Then you have the infrastructure, and then you say, okay, now we have my infrastructure, but everything that runs on my infrastructure is open, is shared. So you don't make any money. So you cannot run the business. You have no jobs. So open data is interesting in specific areas, and is many times used to develop business models. So if you look at, <clears throat> so Facebook at the beginning was an, it's still maybe today an open data platform. You share everything. WhatsApp, you share, now it's closed and so on, but you have different solutions where you share, you communicate, but, and then you develop a business model because your data is being used, is being manipulated, is being uh, treated, uh, and you don't know how. <clears throat> so we need to be very careful about uh, these discussions because there are different implications around it. And um, I am of the view, as you said, that we need regulation because what is happening today in the world with the developments that we are, disruptive technologies that are coming into the, the market, like those coming from the artificial intelligence, we, we are in a, very <clears throat> in a very difficult situation where our own existence as human beings is being threatened. And we need to be aware of this. We need to understand that the new developments in technology that are taking place are overcoming the human capacity. And these are things that are happening every day. And we talk, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about data. We're talking about technology. And, uh, and therefore, we need to step back, have a discussion, and say what we need to do to avoid the disaster. And for that, we need the regulation, we need people that understand the technology and that needs to put in measure the right mechanisms to avoid the problems that we will probably be 
facing in, in the future. So, what we're talking here is about basic human rights at the end of the day. If we do not use the data properly, we are threatening our children. You know, can you imagine how many children go to YouTube using WhatsApp and so on? Do you know what they do? Do you know what can happen? So child safety is a huge issue. Uh, you have others like, well, I will stop because you have another question. <clears throat> Ja, ich, ich würde gerne... Well, I'd like to provoke. I, I, I think uh, it is very good uh, to talk about the uh, very big things. Let me provoke. Wouldn't you say that before our world uh, drowns because of data uh, surveillance, it's going to die of uh, climate change. We need to take care of them all, the, all at the same time. One is climate, one is artificial intelligence, one is growing inequalities. You have more and more people on the top and, and people in 98% of the world is living on, on, on the, the verge of, of a very difficult situation. You have the resources problem that is a huge problem so all these things are coming together and then you have a growing population in the world so in 2100 we will be 11 billion people in the world so what we're talking about here is a, a recipe for disaster so you don't have resources but you have more people so you, you are complicating the situation right you have a, a thing that you do not control like artificial intelligence that threatens jobs so in the future you know i give you an example a company in china called foxcom used to employ one million people today they employ six hundred thousand because four hundred thousand are robots and so all these things come together and they go around technology okay that, that is richtig aber ich glaube das that is correct and I'm not saying that you are wrong, but it's that before we talk about automation and uh, job destruction because of robots, let's mention one more important as, uh, item, international perspectives. Uh, and I think that's interesting too, because here we have the two conflict lines, lines that uh, merge. The poorest people are most affected by climate protection and have no data protection. Yeah the big picture and here let me come back to the open data that we discussed before because when we look at uh, the big issue and the gap between the rich and the poor and the consequences of digitization and climate change affecting the poorest people here it's interesting to see that uh, cities would be open data when we look at the trends and strategy developments we look for sources for confidence it's a normal human need to have trust and confidence to have something to lean on to know how to move in life and that gets more and more difficult because everything is globalized and digitized and they're not many public sources of tr trust and that is also one of the reasons why populism is rising if the cities could be seen as centers of uh, confidence that work with local initiative and uh, open data where people say yeah this is an aspect of stability for me then it would not be so much a question of uh, national or european coordination but rather cities that have a decentralized systems that come into change also and give us the space to really discuss the issues so which are the data i'm going to make available publicly because i trust my city more than the state and this is an enormous uh, psychological potential some cities have already started the smart city initiative like new york amsterdam and others and smart city doesn't mean intelligent traffic management it's uh, the question of uh, the mechanisms of participation uh, where do i get information how about the libraries uh, do they have digital assets do i get information about uh, investment decisions and that will help people also to discuss climate change so because we have a problem with uh, climate change and maybe the cities can be seen as a field of discourse. Thank you. Uh, yes, maybe it's uh, worth a round of applause. 
a fantastic example. And here I can just recommend to all of you a YouTube video. FES was a forum where Francesca Bria appeared. She has developed this very alternative smart city concept, and she talked at that conference and gave a wonderful ex explanation about the grassroots initiatives, uh, which are the elements and data were very important, and also the concept of DIY fabrication, manufacturing, climate-friendly solutions in the urban sector. I have one more, maybe naive question before we open to our audience. We have talked so far about data that are taken from individual sec uh, citizens and that are imp uh, collected and analyzed and that are important for the bigger picture. And we have no, not yet talked about industrial data. We always focus on this citizen and uh, talk about citizens' responsibility. That is the same as in climate protection. Before we talk about the responsibility of the uh, uh, big uh, corporations, uh, the big industries, uh, why do we always focus on the responsibility of the individual citizen instead of focusing on industry, on the big corporations and impose mandatory obligations so that they would uh, also make their data, artificial intelligence data, for instance, available. I can just say I absolutely agree. Of course, most of the responsibility is shifted towards the consumer. And where we have participation models and open source is wonderful. The citizens are responsible. These are positive examples. On the other hand, we have also an accumulation of data and power in the hands of a few. And here we talk about the big corporations. Let's give one example from the energy sector. We also have uh, grid operators that are a monopoly. We do have only one grid, of course, that's all right. That is a monopoly, a natural one. And for us, it goes without saying that these monopolies should make their price structure, their pricing mechanisms transparent, because that has to do with data and money, but they don't do it. We criticize that, have been criticizing that for years, and we still do not know how they make their prices. It shouldn't be tolerated such a situation. It's a good example. I mean, the individual consumer has no chance to understand pricing of energy companies. This is unfair. And it can't be tolerated to say, well, consumer, try to find out yourself. You are responsible. Here, indeed, we need regulation. We need laws. And, of course, there we have lobbyism at play. And, indeed, oftentimes the particular interests of a few um, are most important. And then we also need transparent information. And also labeling is an important issue. Whenever we have good labeling, it's focused on good standards and regulation. And that's helpful for consumers. And it does make sense. And here, I think we need to provide our consumers, our individuals, with support and assistance. Yes, I can just subscribe to what you have said. We are completely overtaxed. I would say that of uh, myself. I mean, when I when I uh, click on the button, data protection rules accepted, I do still not know what happens to my data. Um, aggregation of data to target me, storing information about my individual features and traits to know exactly what I as an individual want and need. And that is a lot of intervention into my private sphere. And here, I think the legislator has not yet fully understand what is in store. May, you may know the study of Cambridge University. 600,000 user data of Facebook were an, analyzed. And we looked at uh, 
how much you can read from these data sets about the individual's personal traits, features, and we could really identify where somebody is homosexual, which religion the person belongs to. Without the people ever having put a like to something, is on the basis of algorithm, you can determine all the individual features and draw conclusions on that person. In the future, one indeed can target very individually, and there we need a legislator who says stop. That is an intervention, an infringement on personal rights. Here, I think it's time for us to open to our audience. There are two people who are going to hand over micro hand out microphones, and so let's stand up so we can see you too. Good morning. It was an excellent discussion. I am really enthusiastic about it and to hear about all the different levels. Uh, it was wonderful to have such a nutshell analysis. Let me focus on two or three aspects because I do not want to talk for a long time. It's a philosophical topic also regarding regulation. And when we have in mind that regulation need not always be something negative. Lobbyists always say that regulation is negative, but also companies, CEOs have accepted that regulation in research and development is very important. There was an initiative in 2007 with an open letter to Tony Blair at the time of BP, ESSO and others, all the oil companies uh, signed that letter saying that they want to have regulation. In Germany, uh, we have the same decision, um, the same discussion about biogas, where regulation is an important thing for us to use for our activities. We also have to look at the cost of infrastructure. Infrastructure was mentioned several times during the discussion. Here I can tell you an anecdote of the utility in Leipzig, if I may. It was in 1996 when the utility in Leipzig, the energy company of Leipzig, set up Elcom, a telecom company, in the framework of deregulation. They wanted to sell telecom services to SMEs, and they launched that company with private money. What happened? The infrastructure of energy supply set up by the taxpayer was made available to this private company so that they could uh, install their telecom services and uh, use them for a private profit. This is the public-private partnership sellout. We have seen that, and that is not a solution. And here, I mean, we have talked about infrastructure costs, uh, uh, and that's also exactly uh, the smart meter issue. They cost money. How do you finance smart meters? The answer is we, are talk we should have a scaling of good solutions. Look at the smart meters that really work well and that are affordable, and they should be made at an affordable, made available at an affordable price to the municipalities, and they have the money to fund that uh, program, that smart metering program. Thank you for having mentioned that historical example. I mean, there's certain debates uh, where we have forgotten to talk about it, infrastructure costs, and at the moment uh, we are discussing the issue why the big digital corporations pay no taxes at all in uh, Europe. Those taxes could be used to f to invest into new developments. So maybe we should collect more taxes also from non-ecological or non-environmentally friendly initiatives to invest into environmental friendliness. Uh, I mean, the government is very much afraid to discuss tax increases. Tax increases are a taboo at the moment. 
20 years ago, the eco tax uh, was raised on electricity, but uh, tax increases are not being discussed at the moment at all. It's a no go. And we do not have such tax discussion in the the digital area, there are so many social innovation tenders. I mean, of course, it's uh, important, but it, ecological innovation, there's not much going on. So the sustainability triangle is being forgotten more and more in our public debate. Good morning. I am Sylvia Traman from Salzburg University. We live in a society where the collection of data also means control and surveillance. That happens in all spheres of life, professional life and private life as well. What kind of regulation instrument do we need? I'm a lawyer uh, and that is why uh, we should also focus on the right to self-determined living and working, the right to be free of surveillance. Let us collect a number of questions. And briefly, Bitkom, the Federal Association of German Digital Companies at the moment looks at smart metering and talks about uh, introducing high-level regulation. So the next question now. Uliad Wolch aus Hamburg. Ich. I am focusing on Google in my work. And we are just running a campaign focusing on Google. Now this is just after the murder of Bayer and Monsanto, and this was about power, and Monsanto argued with uh, the aspect of power. Nobody really looked at what was happening. Only when the civil society intervened, people started, started being aware of what was happening. Now, the civil society in Germany is only beginning to look at what's happening. I was in Amsterdam a few days ago, and this was also about destroying the trusts or the monopolies or the cartels, actually. We would like to have a law which helped us support also the small initiatives and smaller enterprises. So my question is, what do you want to do in terms of an antitrust law? And don't we have to politicize standards like DIN or ISO? I'm representing a community in Brandenburg, and I would like to come back to the example we heard from Leipzig. The man said the local authorities or the municipalities should pay. However, in Germany, 80% of the communities or the municipalities and local authorities cannot decide independently on what they fund and what they don't Fund. Of course, we want to deal with the climate change and, of course, we want to use digital tools. And my question for Mrs. Holtz is the following. You said the legislator doesn't know what is about to happen. We need to offer better information. But I believe that the legislator in Germany definitely knows what's going on and what will happen and they lack the will to pass laws because of the lobbies, the lobbying of big and important corporations. So the civil society is key. We need to show what regulation should look like so that the consumer is truly protected 
and so that the big ones cannot use their power, their economic and political power at will. I mean, they are expanding their power and we are thinking of Orwell, right? So what about legislation? Why are they postponing these new acts? Ja, also was Regulierung anbetrifft, ist ja Greenpeace eine Regulierungsforderungsmaschine. Das heißt Greenpeace is actually an initiative that claims regulation time and again. We are, so to speak, a machine demanding regulation. I'm representing an environmental NGO and we say the legislator knows enough to pass laws. This is what we are seeing right now when people talk about the combustion engine. We are also involved in the coal commission and we say we need to opt out of lignite or coal in general. Now, I can't answer all your questions, but when it comes to data protection, the Internet and privacy, I often had the impression that the federal government does not quite understand what's going on in Germany and on the European level. I think the, the directive or the law protecting the data could have been implemented much earlier, and it's still a weak tool. But I'm not the one to answer this question, I need to say. Now, the question about energy or Greenpeace energy, of course. We are very much in favor of private collective forms in order to do something about the power of big corporations or monopolies. This is what we could see in the course of the energy transformation, a truly green energy is to be offered here, that's what we are saying, which would imply decentralized, collectively organized forms of production. Now, the, the cartels, the trusts, and a self-determined life. Since you mentioned the Data Protection Directive of the EU, Competition is often an EU matter, and it's difficult to coordinate 28 nations, and it's still 28. And it's also difficult for the civil society to really keep track of what is going on and be efficient. Now, we are focusing on the EU policy and less on the national policy. Because if you deal with the internet, it's more efficient to focus on the European or the global level even. Now, the data protection directive is weak in some respects, that's true, but it's an important step that helps us find out what can be done. Right now, there is, for example, the collective right to sue which means that as a citizen I can get together with citizens from other countries and then sue. There's right now, for example, a process, a trial um, initiated by initiatives from different countries in order to put a ban on using our data on platforms like Axiom <coughs> or others. So we think these are tools, tools that help us reduce the power of the corporations and the others at least a bit. But we are focused on the EU level, as I said. And then <coughs> the, let's say the regulation, I think that there are two aspects. Uh, my view is that business 
is losing an opportunity right now. Uh, I think business needs to take bold steps to address the concerns of the consumers um, from the civil society in relation to this discussion around data, privacy and security. Uh, I think companies should define for themselves a set of principles, clear principles, whereby they ensure that they take responsibility and then through that responsibility they create trust in the civil society. And I don't think companies are doing enough. As a companies normally they want to make money and money and money and to make money and to continue to make money they need to change the business model. I think the, the digital technology, the digital industry is making a mistake today. So these principles for digital responsibility, they need to be defined. Then we need a standard. Uh, we, we need someone to control that. We, we need an auditing system so that we make sure that this level of trust exists in, in, in the society. And then, of course, the, the policy makers, they need to fulfill their role as well. So th both things need to go uh, all together. Thank you. Ich möchte noch mal was zum Wettbewerb sagen. Competition is my buzzword. We love good competition. Uh, companies produce products which are bought by consumers and if the competition is good, it's good for the price. 20 years ago, the energy market was deregulated. But then sorry, was regulated. And then people said, we want more competition, so we need to deregulate the market. It was a lengthy and a cumbersome process, which took us five to ten years. It was driven by the EU level, and the German government was not really involved and didn't want to be involved. It took a long time until consumers had the possibility of freely choosing, choosing the energy supplier from whom they wanted to buy their energy, the power they needed, electricity and so on. We could also talk about the medical industry, but energy is interesting. Energy is to be split between two major energy providers, one of them being RWE. And of course, the antitrust agency in Germany is called upon to have a close look. And the same goes for the EU institution, because there is an existing antitrust law in Germany, in the EU, which needs to be applied. If it's not applied, the market doesn't work. And it needs to be applied correctly. That's important for us. All right, let's have a second round of questions and answers. And please be brief. I remember, by the way, a a session together with Ulf who said we need to destroy Facebook in order to have more choice in the field of social media. Right, thank you. Facebook, destroy Facebook. There was also a campaign targeting Twitter. The idea was to have Twitter be organized or run by a collective, so to speak, the re-communalization of a Twitter. Ultimately, we need to decide whether we want to die from climate protection or data protection. That's a situation which we have to bear with. People say that politicians don't dare to levy taxes anymore, and that's the problem we are dealing with because we have depowered ourselves, politically spoken. And we are just believing in the idea of growth. So we allow that corporations and startups can generate uh, revenue without any limits. And we don't want any regulation. 
But maybe we have to turn the tide and we have to ask ourselves what can be done so that we reach social goals at lower costs. So this is not growth at any price, but the maintenance and protection of our planet. It's nice to see the dialogue between the audience and the panelists, and your statement has almost been a concluding remark, because we have to talk about the post-capitalist society. Maybe there's one more question. If not, we'll have the final round on the panel. Guten Tag, um, my name is Dorothea Ernst. Ich hatte von 2000 From 2006 to 2011, I was with Philips, one of the corporations you are angry about. And I was the one to introduce sustainable innovation initiatives, which was a pioneer task because I was the first who ever did this in the company, health and safety. Well, sustainability had always been an aspect in the health, health and safety regulations. We looked at the environment, of course, and made sure that there were no hazards. But otherwise, we were not really involved, and we had never gone and geared our innovation strategies according to environmental and sustainable principles. My question for the panelists is, what about seeing corporations as a partner in transformation instead of seeing corporations only as the source of the problem? When I worked on this topic for Philips, I was on the double bad guy side quite often, which is good because there are companies and it's also important to have corporations for society, it's important. So I wonder what needs to happen so that companies can be your partners and not only the ones to put the blame on. Bitte greift alle die Frage auf. Ich würde sie einfach nur noch mal ergänzen und erweitern. Wir hatten ja vorhin schon mal Now in addition to this question, I would like to bring up the idea of alliances and maybe we can have a positive outlook now at the very end of the panel. What about new alliances? What new alliances are feasible between governments, politicians, corporations, grassroots initi initiatives, and so on? What possibilities do you see? What could be the cool idea everybody can take with him or her when leaving. Yes, uh, the, 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 the main discussion was about Bits and Boimer. I would like to, I think I can confirm that the ICT industry, so the digital, the digital industry will be getting more trees into the world. So our latest report says that we can reduce 20% of the global emissions between 2015 and 2030. And I think this is a, a clear positive message. I do believe that this figure is even bigger next year when we do the, 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 the next uh, report. The other thing is that from uh, the private sector and coming from the last question, from the private sector perspective, uh, we are now in Jesse creating um, an innovators network platform. It's, it's, it's an online platform to discuss this problematic that we are talking around this, this room. And this platform will be made of private sector, NGOs, so we have Amnesty International, we have foundations, we can have consumer initiatives or Greenpeace, part of that. Uh, we have people, we have governments. It's a platform where we want to discuss and educate people around the challenges that we have, data security, climate change, refugees issues, data protection, whatever. We will have different clusters and um, we want to 
initiate a dialogue around this online, uh, whereby we came up with solutions uh, to respond to, to quite big challenges that we, we have around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Innovators Network. <laughs> Ähm, das, das war wirklich eine sehr philosophische Runde. Wie, wie, wie geht man damit am besten um? Also zum einen was Now this has been a truly philosophical round. What do I expect from new alliances? Was one of the questions we've asked. I think we can learn a lot from each other. I think there is a lot of potential also in the cities who can be players and of course the companies are not the only guilty ones of course there are problems we need to talk about and the civil society and all players need to accept and that includes corporations as well that if you make mistakes you need to bear with the criticism and if you have power you should use it responsibly We need to protect the private sphere, and everybody needs to be aware of this need. Otherwise, I cannot design my systems accordingly. This is not about profits only. This is not about the shareholders only. We need to rethink. Thank you. Um, Verbraucherinnen und Verbraucher. Cons cons consumers. are increasingly interested in sustainability and sustainable products. And we're talking about this topic all the time, and we are happy to see many people working in this field, also working on the transparency. Our forderung auch ist um, im Bereich um, Digitalisierung, digitales. Did es ist ganz wichtig, dass, wenn man das. It's also important, if you talk about digitization, to bear in mind that those who want to be at home and feel at home and stay at home in the analog world can do so in 10 years. The environment is, for me, the bigger problem, even more important than big data. But I'm also seeing the neoliberal context because we need to see the patterns, production patterns, consumption patterns, have an impact on our environment, which means that we stay with fossil fuels for much longer because the energy is needed. In other words, unless we manage to enhance our political influence and focus more on the common good, unless we manage to really ask the question, what do we need? We won't be capable of acting responsibly and reasonably for the environment in the environment for the protection of our climate. Thank you very much for these statements. It was a real pleasure to have you here to listen to you. It was worthwhile. Thank you for having shared the stage with me. Applause.